Our community is rich with black history. Freedom and equality, civil rights has always been our mantra. Built from the people and ideas who helped shape who we are today. Black history, it is being reborn in my accomplishments. This Black History Month, we're celebrating the vibrant, resilient black community in East Tennessee. WATE 6 at your side, honoring black history. Good evening, I'm Teresa Smith. And I'm Veronica Obey. Thanks for joining us. Tonight, we are honoring Black History Month, taking a close look at the history, culture, and contributions of the black community right here in East Tennessee. The 2024 national theme for Black History Month is African Americans and the arts. It's a time to showcase the impact black Americans had on visual arts, performing arts, and of course, that means music. Absolutely. <laughs> I sat down with the 2019 Knoxville Martin Luther King Commission's Arts and Award winner, Brian Clay, to talk about his emerging career. I'm a, I'm a lifelong musician. That's what, I'm an entertainer. I'm a creative. The gift of music came easy to East Tennessee's Brian Clay. Love has truly been good to me. The idea of creating music is like an equation for the creative soul. If I was looking at it from a mathematics point of view, the numbers just bounce around the page and come alive. It's, it's not just figuring out the formula, but actually creating the formula in a way um, that I can hear something in my head and then from the point that I hear it in my head to the point where it's recorded and produced and everybody else can listen, that whole process is just amazing. It's an amazing freedom. His talent is a celebration of black music. I can do Beethoven and, and Bach and Hannon and all that stuff, but I had an amazing uh, piano teacher early on that would say, okay, if you get through the Beethoven stuff, I've got Billy Joel over here. I've got Lionel Richie here that I'm going to teach you. I've got, you know, that kind of thing. So I got it early, kind of both sides, but it's the, jazz is freedom. Jazz is an improvisational uh, music by nature. It's a black art form. It's African American people in this country a century ago, even more, creating music that was free. And that's what draws me to jazz. Clay recently announcing he was awarded a grant by South Arts, which will allow him to take his music on the road throughout the southern region. As a child, he never thought his love for music would take him this far. Little Brian was just thinking, um, I, like, I like this thing I do. And all of Little Brian's friends were like, we're going to go outside and play baseball. All right, see how we can get back because I'm going to be in here doing this thing. Never thought that I'd be able to provide for my family, to live the happiest moments of my life through my music. I never, never thought that. And the joy of music increases with every song. I can listen to him play all day. We should know Clay will be playing at the National Museum of African American Music in Nashville this year, which he highlights as a major honor. Uh, so cool. We definitely love Brian here. Well, fitting with this year's theme, Rhea Carmen uses her poetic voice to create spaces for conversations on current issues of social change and justice. It's through her own story and creative flow that she finds strength to speak for those who came before her and the many generations that will come after. Black history is the past, but it's not in the past. It is beating in my heart every time I take the stage. Rhea Carmen, the first African-American poet laureate of Knoxville, is a mentor, a motivational speaker, and a math teacher. However, she finds herself teaching valuable lessons through her poetry. It's a feeling of knowing this is what finally needs to be heard. My message in all of my poems is humanity. So I use my story and the things that I've gone through uh, as a woman of color to help other people connect with me as Raya. And then when you start to see my humanity, 
it tears down all of those walls that try to divide us. The story Carmen delivers on stage is one with much history, dating back to her fourth great-grandmother. On my father's side, it was a slave cook who came to Alabama with her slave owner and started our family. She never would have thought that all these years later, she'd have a granddaughter who was making black history. To reach the milestone she's accomplished today, Carmen thanks her family for being proud of their roots and making black history a priority in their household. My father made us read from the African-American encyclopedias growing up. We had to do Saturday reports in, in the basement of our house and find something that resonated with us in black history and write about it. That was, we had to do that starting at seven years old. What might have seemed crazy then, only now, shows Carmen the full picture. What her family did to raise her was in hopes of providing her with a better life. And as she looks back at her achievements and what is still yet to come, she is grateful. All of their sacrifices, you know? Yeah. My grandmother, she cleaned houses, you know, my mom worked jobs she didn't want to go to. My father was in the military. Just all of, all of them made me this ray of sunshine poet, you know, and that I never forget, and I don't take it for granted. Black history, it is being reborn in my accomplishments. And it will never stop forming me. As black history continues to form Carmen, she says others can be inspired too. Not only by her poems, but Carmen's husband started a nonprofit called the Universal Black History Education Initiative. It was started to help continue the conversation around East Tennessee black history and beyond. A beacon in the community with roots that go all the way back to the Underground Railroad. Greater Warner Tabernacle AME Zion Church in East Knoxville was the first black church in the city and continues to be a place of community. WATE Six on Your Side reporter Ella Wales found out what its rich history means to those who serve there. For Pastor Cleo Brooks Jr., the history at Greater Warner Tabernacle AME Zion Church makes his role even more special. It brings on a another dimension of responsibility as far as feeling like handing up, uh, holding up that banner of being not only a church, but being a beacon in the community. He says throughout history, the church has been a place of refuge for the black community, especially when they weren't welcomed elsewhere. In the black community as a whole, the church has always been kind of that grounding place that whenever the community, the black people in the community, if they didn't have anywhere else they could go, they knew that they could turn to the church. Greater Warner was originally established in 1845 as community church. As the chairman of the trustee board for the church, Kira Wyatt wants to continue that sense of community through a new project. This original sanctuary, we are under renovations. We have partnered up with the East Tennessee Community Design Center, and we are going to present to the community the Burlington Lighthouse Conference and Performing Arts Center. The center will have community space, classrooms, and a mental health facility. The church serving the community today as it did throughout history. We were privileged to be a part of the Underground Railroad. And for those of you who don't know that history, that was the Underground Railroad with Harriet Tubman when she was really trying to help free the slaves. She also was a member of the AME Zion Church, the Freedom Church. So freedom and equality, Civil rights has always been our mantra. In Knoxville, Ella Wales, WATE 6, on your side. The church has also been the venue for various Martin Luther King Jr. Day events over the years. Cal Johnson is a familiar name in Knoxville, even though he died nearly 100 years ago. Born enslaved, Johnson rose to prominence, becoming one of the wealthiest African-American businessmen in Tennessee. But as anchor Lori Tucker shows us, it's what Johnson did with his fortune that truly sets him apart. I am with Reverend Renee Kessler here at the Beck Cultural Exchange Center 
in the Heritage Room, and it's all about Cal Johnson. It is. Well, it's all about our heritage, and it's all about his role mm -hmm. in that heritage right here in Knoxville. On the walls of this room filled with history, you see that Cal Johnson was into racehorses. He made a fortune. He also ran successful saloons. In fact, there's a Cal Johnson rum you can buy today. He used a lot of his money to help others. In 1898, Johnson would go on to finance the construction of a building on State Street bearing his name. Despite never having children, Johnson had a heart for kids, investing in the Cal Johnson Park, building a beautiful fountain and archway, lighting a Christmas tree every year for families to enjoy. Today, the Cal Johnson Rec Center stands where the park used to be, continuing his legacy. Another building, now gone, provided a home for children who needed one. Johnson donated an untold amount of money to the orphanage founded by James and Ethel Beck. It has personal significance for Renee Kessler. Can I'm I tell you something you. Perfect, uh, yeah. personal? Yeah. Yeah, I don't share this with a lot of people. Oh. Cal Johnson used his money to help with the Ethel Beck Orphanage mm -hmm. because many children did not have a home. Um, to live in and he thought that was a travesty like Miss Ethel Beck mm -hmm. and I'm grateful very grateful that he did that Lori because my mom lived in that orphanage oh, oh my yeah. goodness mm. wow mm. at the Beck Center I'm Lori Tucker well, a fun fact about Cal Johnson, he also owned several thoroughbred racehorses and once captured a world speed record in 1893. A fascinating life. <laughs> All right, still to come as we honor Black History tonight, an annual festival celebrating music and the arts in our area is centered around one successful black musician, his story of determination and perseverance that put him on the map. Plus, he's accomplished his dream of playing hockey professionally, how one Knoxville ice bear is working to make the league and the game more inclusive. Welcome back. Murmur's Bakery on Gay Street just celebrated 25 years. And many believe this was one of the first black businesses on Gay Street when it opened in 1998. The owner, Chandra Taylor, had just graduated from Pellissippi State. She didn't have any money, but she had a business plan and a dream to open her own bakery. And I explained to him that I had no money. But I had a, a talent, and I know if he allowed me the chance to come in, that I could make him some rent. And he smiled at me, and he said, you know what, you have spunk. And he gave me the keys. You're welcome, thank you. Oh, it means a lot. I'm just so very proud of her. It just shows a little bit of her, my mommy's character and how she's very strong and strong-willed. 25 years later, they're still going strong. Chandra says it's her famous pound cake that brings people into the bakery, but her daughters say it's their mom's relationship with her customers that keep them coming back for more. Last month, a very special member of the Knoxville community passed away. Miss Ether Rice Jackson died in early January at the age of 103. Miss Jackson was a staff member at the Beck Cultural Exchange Center for decades and volunteered until her final days. Now we are told that she took on the job of organizing and archiving the obituaries of each and every African American in the Knoxville community that passes each and every year. It's the Beck's unique way of remembering everyone's impact on the community, not just the famous or the rich. Reverend Renee Kessler, the Beck's current president, tells us Miss Jackson was a mighty woman of God who has left a lasting impression on the Knoxville community. Ether Rice Jackson has taught us what it means to serve, to give, to care, and to do it with a genuine spirit of love, no respecter of person. And she was never angry. She lived over a century. Her legacy will be commemorated here at Beck. Her work will never be forgotten. And what she started, we will continue. Reverend Kessler tells us Miss Jackson lived by Martin Luther King's words. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Still to come as we honor Black History tonight, the Louie Bluey Festival happens every year in East Tennessee, celebrating the arts in Appalachia. But who is Louie Bluey? Meet the man behind the name, an inspirational musician, when we come back. 
Welcome back. The Louis Bluey Music and Arts Festival takes place every year in Caraval, and it's all centered around one man. His name is Howard Armstrong, also known as Louis Bluey. As a very successful musician who faced many trials and tribulations, the Campbell Culture Coalition shares that his story is one of determination and perseverance. Howard Armstrong, and his stage name was Louis Bluey, uh, actually he was born in Ohio, but he moved to Campbell County, Tennessee when he was roughly eight or nine years old. And his dad worked actually in the coal fields, and that's why they came down here for work, following the work. Um, at a very young age, he, he was very interested in mu music, started playing music, but they were really quite poor. So he found a way, and his dad helped him, to make instruments just out of things that they had. And then when he was roughly about the age of 12 or 13, he left school because he had such a musical interest. He left school and he came to Knoxville and uh, the Martin Roland, the blind fiddler from here took him in. Howard's first recording was at the St. St. James Hotel on Gay Street, right here in Knoxville. Now, Howard was a very smart man. Not only was he talented, he was very smart, and he understood and he realized that to appeal to a broader audience, he had to diversify his music, and that's exactly what he did. He played gospel, country, blues, bluegrass, and one of the, and, and he played, he really relied heavily on European folk music. By the time he was a, a grown man, he actually mastered seven languages. But we little poverty knows no color line. We little white kids, I mean little black kids and little white kids would all play together and everything. I know a little boy named Giuseppe Lobatini Italian. I'm going to take you home and meet my uncle and my dad. It so happened at that time I was reading and speaking Italian better grammatically than I was English, you know. Because if you can't keep up, you sure enough can't catch up. And I'm gone, you hear me? I'm dusting my broom. Yeah. He played 22 instruments. And he wasn't always a musician. He was a painter. Uh, he, he had beautiful artwork. He created beautiful artwork. He couldn't just rely on the music to carry him forward because it was tough times. He was, you know, in the, born and raised in the Depression, and he was black, and he faced Jim Crow, bigotry, and he had no money, really, but he had a vision, and he had a dream, and, and, and he persevered, and he just kept pushing and pushing and pushing to do what he was able to accomplish in his life, which was incredible. The Campbell Culture Coalition puts on the festival the last Saturday of September, but they hold different programs throughout the year, especially within schools, to continue sharing Louis Bluey's story. In 2022, the National Hockey League released its first diversity and inclusion report. It showed that work needs to be done as just under 5% of the league identifies as black. But as one member of the Knoxville Ice Bears tells Six on Your Side, Bo Williams, he hopes to help grow the games for minorities at all levels. When you're young, you dream about what could be. And when you're a youngster growing up in Canada, that dream can only mean one thing. Something about hockey, it's just, it's just different. Um, you just learn to love it so much. For first year Knoxville Ice Bear Troy Murray, playing hockey at the professional level is a dream fulfilled. Wherever it takes you, you just know it's, you're, you're playing hockey. As a child growing up in Toronto, Murray tells us his inspirations were longtime Calgary Flame and Hall of Famer Jerome McGinley and one-time Nashville Predator P.K. Subban, both black players making an impact at the game's highest level. I remember watching a lot of P.K. Subban. He's a flashy player, but, you know, he's, he's strong. He's a good skater. He's got a hard slap shot. And while Subban and Aginlo were Murray's inspirations growing up, he now finds himself inspiring others. I volunteer back home. There's um, an organization called Seaside um, with Kirk Brooks, who's doing a lot of work there for, you know, underprivileged kids of color. 
And it's just, you know, growing the game for the diverse community and kind of letting them see what it's like and just kind of being a role model for them, saying that, you know, it's a possibility for you as well and kind of just make it more normal for them. But unfortunately, being black and playing hockey still isn't necessarily the norm. As a matter of fact, even today, racist comments still find their way into the game, whether it be from opposing fans or players. It's not, it's not common, and it's not happening as much, which I'm very thankful for, but um, it has happened. When I was younger and I didn't know how to you know, process these things, uh, it definitely took a toll on my emotional state. It's just ignorance and I don't need to react to it. It's, it doesn't need to exist anymore. What needs to exist are more opportunities for minorities. I think as time goes, you know, things will start to slowly change and uh, this sport will become more inclusive. Um, you know, minorities will be playing this game. I'm proud of who I am, I will say that. We have like a whole black community, like we all know each other because it's so small. Small for now, but growing. As players like Murray hope to inspire other youngsters to keep dreaming of someday playing at the next level. Bo Williams, WATE, six on your side. Another sign of the sport becoming more diverse. In June of 2023, Tennessee State announced that it will become the first historically black college or university to offer men's ice hockey at the collegiate level. Uh, so good to hear that. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us as we honored black history here in East Tennessee and across the country. For more stories of resilience, creativity, and success in the black community, you can head to our website, WATE.com.